Well, thank you, Addison. Good morning to you. You all right? Good, doing good. Welcome to Citadel Square. If you're new, my name is Steve, one of the pastors here. Uh, if you got a Bible, why don't you go ahead and grab it. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the pew rack in front of you, around you somewhere, a black one. Uh, and the page numbers for where we'll be today will be on the screen behind me. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 14. Not a hard book to find. Turn all the way to your right, flop it open, and you'll find the book of Revelation. Revelation 14 is where we're going to be. Uh, we read this morning from um, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, Paul talks about in that section that we read for you the, uh, the different kinds of individuals. He uses three illustrations around the idea of discipleship. In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, we read three through something. Uh, in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, he says, the things that you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others. You've maybe read that verse before. And then he goes on to give three examples of the kind of work that needs to be done in discipleship. And he uses three illustrations. He says there's an athlete who isn't going to be crowned as winning unless he competes according to the rules. There's going to be a soldier whose ultimate goal is not to get entangled in civilian affairs and civilian pursuits, but to please his commanding officer. And then he talks about the farmer. And the farmer illustration, he says that uh, the farmer has to uh, sow and water and plant and do all of these things so that one day there might be a fruit or a crop. Um, and the illustrations that Paul uses there are important because they pertain to our Christian life. They pertain to our journey as we walk through this life and our relationship with Jesus Christ as we're Christians, we're moving toward uh, seeing Christ face to face. Won't that be great? That sin will fall away and that one day we will see him and we will know him even as we are fully known. That's the promise for the Christian. Uh, and what we're going to look at here today in Revelation chapter 14 is uh, something that up to this point in the book has only been hinted at. We've seen the judgment of God fall on the earth through the six seals and the six trumpets. And now where we are in the book in Revelation 14 is as the seventh trumpet is sounded, we've had this biographical section, this kind of like character study of a variety of individuals, uh, Satan, his fall from heaven, the Antichrist, the false prophet. Uh, we've seen people on the earth who refuse to repent because of the judgments that are falling. And then what we're going to see just in a chapter or two in Revelation 15 and 16 are the seven bowls and they're going to come. And as such, where we've been in the book has not looked at what happens after Revelation, right? Because after the book of Revelation, the chronological end of your Bible is forever and ever and ever, right? So that we know how the story ends, but that's not how eternity ends, that eternity moves on from the book of Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 14, we get our first glimpse at eternity, the first moment where forever and ever is applied not to God and the worship that he is due, not even to his character, but to individuals who will experience somewhere forever and ever and ever. So that when we read texts like 2 Timothy chapter 2, the important thing for you as a Christian, for you to live well as a Christian, you need the word of God. You need the spirit of God in your life. But for you to live wisely throughout the course of your Christian experience, you need to know where we're headed, don't you? You need to know that like ultimate blessing isn't like just six months from now or 10 years from now or in the place where I hope God to answer my prayers for my job or my spouse or the job that I need to get. You need to know that we are headed to forever and ever, amen, right? And for you to live wisely, you need to understand that the decisions that you and I make, the decisions that characterize the normalcy of our lives are working to put us into our destiny. Now, that seems pretty heavy. I get it. We just started the sermon. That seems pretty intense. And the reason it feels intense and it feels heavy is that we have a tendency to ignore that reality. 
that every single person in this room will spend eternity somewhere. Everyone. There is no third party. As you sit back and go, well, there's heaven, there's hell, and then there's me, and I'm like Switzerland. I'm just not into that worship stuff. But the book of Revelation is, is consummately clear that we're all headed somewhere. And today in Revelation 14, we get a glimpse, a moment where we get to see eternity. Now, this text breaks down very simply. You've got three messages from three angels. You have a a piece of counsel from John, and then you have God himself closing the passage, giving you an affirmation of how you ought to live during your time on this earth. That your choices today have consequences. Your decisions determine your destiny. That you are headed somewhere. Your spiritual life is forming you and creating for you this this inevitable future that we're going to see a glimpse of here in Revelation 14. All right? So let's jump in here together. Grab your Bibles. Revelation chapter 14. Let me pray and ask God for his grace. Father in heaven, I pray that the weight of this passage would settle into our hearts and souls this morning. That what we don't understand about eternity would be clear because of Revelation 14. That we would look at this with a sobriety in our hearts, with uh, courage where we are weak, where, where we're, we're characterized by unbelief, that you would secure belief in our hearts for us. That we would see things about you that perhaps we haven't seen before, we haven't thought about in a long time. Father, would you give light to our eyes as your word says that the unfolding of your word gives light. And that's what we pray here today. That for these few minutes, you would bless us through your word and through your spirit to turn our hearts to praise and to worship and to courage again about our spiritual lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. And for his sake, amen. See, one of the things that happens when we talk about discipleship and our our Christian growth is that you and I need to know what the stakes are, right? I'm not very um, directionally savvy. I can say that because we're we're family, right? I don't have to be great at driving directions. My wife, she has like an inner compass. She's like Daniel Boone. She knows like she's been there once. She could get there again blindfolded. That's like, that's the woman I married. And as such, I get lost from time to time. I go the way I shouldn't go, but inevitably, I arrive home, right? And I made it. And I'm not necessarily early. I'm probably late, but I made it. Because all of the paths that I take inevitably, finally, and ultimately will get me home. But that's not the case with our spiritual lives. Our spiritual lives carry with them a kind of formation, that as we worship and as we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're being changed. You with me? That Paul says in the book of 2 Corinthians that we're being transformed from one image of glory to another by the Lord who is the Spirit, That, that God's working in us and he's changing us to ultimately bring us home. Now, that with that in mind, I want you to look at Revelation 14. Last week, Revelation 14 looked at this future vision of victory, that Antichrist was in control, the false prophet is preaching, everybody believes in him, an image is set up, the economics of the day flow toward the will of the dragon, the uh, religious life of the day flows toward worship of this beast who set himself up as God in Jerusalem. And what we saw in the beginning of Revelation 14 is this vision of victory, where the lamb is standing with the 144,000, where they weren't touched. They won. And now, in similar kind, you're going to see preaching that happens here that shows you a future vision of what's going to happen on earth. So there there are two future visions that help you to understand. Let's take a look at these angels and as they preach. Look at verse 6 with me. Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead. Now, where we've been in the book of Revelation is that Satan has been cleansed from heaven, right? Satan has been pressed down out of heaven. No more accusations will he bring against God and his people. He's come down to earth in great wrath. Heaven itself, it says, woe to you, earth, because Satan's come down in great wrath, and he is now about to 
um, mobilize everything on the planet toward his own worship and his own great authority. And now here comes an angel flying directly overhead. Between heaven and earth, here's this angel who's doing something. Look at the remainder of the verse. With an eternal gospel to proclaim. Now, that sets you up for what you're about to see in the remainder of this kind of little section in the book of Revelation. That we believe the gospel is not just a worldview. We believe the gospel is not just truth about God in heaven, but the gospel itself carries eternal ramifications. Do you believe that? That what you believe about God, what you believe about Jesus Christ, his perfect life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension into heaven, has eternal implications. Throughout all time, in every place, with every person, this angel is now preaching something that has eternal consequences to it. So that to deny the gospel comes with eternal consequences. To receive the gospel message comes with eternal consequences, whatever those may be. So here's this angel with an eternal gospel to proclaim. That word proclaim was used one other time in the book of Revelation. Would you keep your finger there in, in Revelation 14? Turn back to Revelation chapter 10. <clears throat> Look at Revelation 10, verse 5. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced. It's the word uh, essentially to preach the gospel, to preach the good news. And it, he announced it through his servants, the prophets. Now, come back to Revelation 14. There are two spots in Revelation now where the gospel is proclaimed and preached. It's an interesting word because between the first time this word is used and the last time which, where this word is used, which is actually right here, what you have in Revelation 14 is the earth's last altar call. It's the last time the good news is going to be proclaimed. The last gospel message is given by this angel. You know, where the, you know what the first place in your Bible or in your New Testament this word is used? The first time it's used, it's used by Gabriel in his announcement to Mary where he announces good news to Mary so that the preaching ministry of the gospel message begins with an angel giving good news to Mary. It's the same gospel message that the angels give to the shepherds, that behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And the last gospel message is preached by an angel. Who preaches it in between? Guess what? They're in the room, right? The Christians, the Christians preach that we have the responsibility to take the good news, the gospel message into all the earth. And God in his infinite grace and mercy, as the wrath of God is being poured out on this planet and the Antichrist and the false prophet and Satan himself are in control, God continues to preach the gospel message even if it comes through the voice of an angel. Now you're gonna have multiple preachers during this time. You had the 144,000 last week. You had the two witnesses in Jerusalem. You have the people who will give their lives for the gospel message during the end times, and then God will stop at nothing. He'll put the gospel message even in the mouth of an angel to make sure that anybody and everybody in all times and in all places has an opportunity to repent. Isn't he kind to do that? Why do we pray for Algeria? Because we believe that everybody in every place and in every time, I don't care what era of history they are, they need the eternal gospel message. I don't care what place they live on planet Earth, we believe that they need the eternal gospel message. Look at what the remainder of the verse says in verse 6. Who does he preach it to? To every nation, to every tribe, and every language, and every people. How many people is that on Earth? 100%. Every single one of them. Here's this angel. This fulfills what Jesus says in Matthew 24, that the gospel must be preached to all nations and then the end will come. God will make sure that everybody in this time has an opportunity to hear and respond and receive the message of salvation through the gospel message because of God's kindness and patience toward all he has made. Now let's look at the message. Look at verse seven. He said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory. 
Now, that's kind of shorthand for repentance and conversion in the book of Revelation. Just go forward one chapter to, verse, uh, to, to 15. Look at 15, verse 4. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and what? They'll worship you. That fearing God means that he is the north star in my life. That I now begin to make decisions based upon God and his character and who he is and what he has done. And number two, I live in light of the truth of God, his eternality, his perfect character, his perfect kindness, his sovereign goodness and all those things. And I respond as a human in light of that. Turn forward one more place to Revelation 16. Look at 16.9. Sixteen nine says this, they were scorched by the fierce heat and they cursed the name of God who had the power over these plagues. They did not, what? Repent and give him glory. So fearing God has to do with understanding who he is. Giving him glory has to do with turning in repentance and sorrow over my sin because of who God is and what he has done. And the commandment of the angel, the, the calling now to the entire world is to fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Isn't that great? That there's gospel preaching all the way up to the hour his, his judgment comes. When, can you, when should you repent? Today. Like 10 minutes ago. That's when you should repent. Because there's coming a time when the hour of judgment will fall. This consistently in John's writing in his gospel has to do with Jesus and as he heads to the cross. That his hour is the singular greatest event in his life. And here at the end, angels themselves will preach the gospel right up to the time where judgment will fall. You know when judgment falls? The very next paragraph. Look at what 14 says. Are you back in 14? We're flipping around. I got to make you work for it here in Revelation a little bit. Look at, look at uh, 14. Um, look at 14, 15. Another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put your sickle and reap for the what? The hour to reap has come. When is the gospel message preached? Right up until the end. Fear God, give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. You know where judgment's about to fall? On all of those places. There's been a divine restraint in the trumpet judgments. Remember, a third of the springs of the water were cursed and turned to bitterness, that a third of the oceans were turned to blood. When the bowls fall, the whole ocean turns to blood. All the springs are gone. And what's interesting here is is we have a reminder of all the way back in Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation chapter 4, it says God is worthy because he created everything. He's worthy to judge. You know why? Because he owns all of it. It's all his. By his word, he spoke the planets and the giraffes and the tides into existence. And he has the right to do with his stuff whatever he wishes. Look, you believe that in your own house, don't you? That it's my stuff. I bought it. I can take it away. I can throw it away if I want to. Have I had this conversation with my children? I sure have. You didn't buy it. I bought it. Paul, in his travels does this. A lot of times when Paul travels, he'll go to the synagogue first, and he'll talk about the fulfillment of Jesus Christ and the Old Testament Israel hopes that characterize all the Old Testament, that they're all looking forward to the Messiah. But when he goes to people who don't know the historic God of Israel, he takes a different tactic when he preaches. He appeals to this very fact about God and who he is. Let me, let me show you this. Flip back here to Acts chapter 14. In Acts, Paul is traveling and he heals a guy who's crippled. And everybody in the city turns to Paul and they go, listen, it's Zeus and it's Hermes. It's the Greek gods incarnate. This is fantastic. They're here. Get a bull. Let's sacrifice. This is awesome. They came down. The gods are among us. They're healing people. This is wonderful. Acts 14. Look at Acts 14, 14. After that happens, here's what Paul and Barnabas say. 
But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd crying, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. What is God's witness of himself and who he is in nations that don't have knowledge of the one true God? Look at what he says. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness, and even with these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. Turn forward to Acts 17. Paul in, uh, addresses the Areopagus in Athens, and he says this. He, he, Paul shows up in Athens, and they have all of these worship centers. And because they're scared that they missed one, they set up a, an altar to the unknown God. And they go, well, if we missed one, we'll get him with that one, and we'll make sure that he's pleased. And Paul says, this is great. I've got an opportunity to, pro to proclaim something to you that you have no idea what it is, and I'm about to give you some knowledge right now. Verse 24, 17, 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places. Turn back to Revelation. Paul begins with the fact that God is the creator God. Paul, in his in his massive writing in the book of Romans, said that God's eternal power and divine nature are clearly perceived by what has been made so that mankind is without excuse. So if I'm gonna talk to, maybe you're not a spiritual person and you just came into the church because boy, I, I feel like I should go to church and this is a good day. You picked a great Sunday to join us. I'm so glad you're here. But God in his word declares himself to be the creator and ruler, the one living and true God over anything and everything all over the planet, all over creation, and declares to you today that you ought to repent. Because he owns it all. And you have a problem between yourself and the God who made everything. See, Paul believes a category of thinking is the fact that God who made it all is absolutely worthy of your worship. It's an apologetic for Paul. He says, you're experiencing the blessings of living life on his earth with his light and his air and his water and breathing and all. You get the food that he has made the earth to produce for you and you receive it and you ignore him. And he has the right and the authority to judge. Revelation 14, Revelation chapter 4. Now, what do you expect between verse 7 and 8? And lo, there was massive repentance. And the whole earth turned to receive the one true and living God and there is a deafening silence between seven and eight, isn't there? An angel flying high above, proclaiming an eternal gospel to every single person and every place in the planet that can save anybody at any time, anywhere they are, no matter what they have done. And there's no response. Now look at verse eight. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Babylon, now this is an interesting pass, uh, kind of phrase here. Babylon uh, begins way back in Genesis chapter 10. It's the very place where mankind got together when all of their language worked right, and they decided to build a tower that reached into the heavens, and they called it Bab-el, which means the gate of God. And it says in Genesis chapter 10 that God came down which is kind of ironic that they think they can make their way all the way up to God. God's too high. God's got to come down and God's got to see what they are doing. And God at that place says, mankind working together in their sinfulness and wickedness will uh, be able to do anything and everything they desire. So what I will do is I will confuse their language and I will call it Babel, which in the Hebrew means confusion. 
Now Babylon becomes the, the central ruling city of the nation of the Babylonians. And in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar basically quotes what John does here in Revelation 14 when he's walking around Babylon and he says, isn't this great Babylon what I have made for my own glory and majesty? Now, when you get to the end times, we're, not gonna, we're gonna see Babylon destroyed here in a couple of chapters. But Babylon here at the end becomes the center religious, economic, political power of the day. It becomes the place that up to this point everybody is running to for safety, receiving the mark of the beast on their head and on their hand, receiving now economic opportunity because they worship the beast. They put their hope and their uh, comfort and their peace and their security all in the hands of the Antichrist, the beast. And just a couple of chapters ago, we saw that those who observe the beast in this world power of the day say, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? He is unstoppable. And what this angel number two preaches is that Babylon is done. It is destroyed. It's as good as gone. So just like the beginning of Revelation 14 gave you a future picture of victory, the middle of Revelation 14 gives you a future picture of destruction that we know where Babylon is headed. Fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now, last week we talked about the individuals who refrained from sexual promiscuity and immorality in their day. Now we're looking at a city whose theme is essentially false worship, characterized by sexual immorality that it's trading worship of the one true God for worship of Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet. And you notice here in this verse that it's compelling. They make it happen. They demand worldwide adoration. Now, uh, you know, this is important not just for where we're headed at toward the end of our text here today, but it's important right now that when you are walking with Jesus, when you are making decisions about your spiritual life, about faith and unbelief and uh, holding the line and the things that you know are true and, and striving for sanctification and, and walking with Jesus Christ, you've got to know that the end of those who put their faith in anything other then Jesus Christ and the salvation found in him will ultimately find destruction. That they will not be saved. There, there isn't a plan B. There's not like Jesus, good works, given a lot of money, any of those will work. It's that there's salvation found under heaven in no one else, right? There's only one way, truth, and life. It's only Jesus. And the important thing for you to see in the message of angel number two is that anywhere else other than Jesus that you seek to find safety, security, comfort, rest, peace, significance will ultimately burn to the ground. God will take it upon himself to eradicate it and make it a parking lot. And you need to know those stakes. I, 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 maybe nobody has told you that. Maybe it's just, it's a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of this over here and a little bit of this over here. But you need to know if you're putting your faith anything in anything other than Jesus Christ, it's headed here. It's headed toward fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. This is why when you get to places like Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about Abraham who's, who was looking forward to the city that is to come because he's looking at life on this planet and he recognizes there's no hope, there's no safety, there's no security here, there's no fulfillment here. I'm looking forward to a city that whose foundation and builder is God. That when Moses leaves Egypt, he considers reproach with the people of God greater than all the pleasures of all Egypt. That we stand as Christians between heaven and earth and as you grow in your walking with the Lord, your heart continues to long for what is not here. You feel that? 
There's that longing in my soul that, that on earth is nothing I desire, Psalm 73 says. Have you felt that? Or are you satisfied here? This is where Babylon is headed. Here's your third angel. Look at verse 9. Another angel, a third, followed them. So you, you see, eternal gospel preached, the end of all the worldly kingdoms opposing Jesus Christ and his rule. And number three, we have the outcome. We have eternity in the message of angel number three. We have the destiny of where everybody, no matter who they are, no matter what tribe, language, tongue, or nation they are from, will be headed. Another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast. Do you see how the, the change has happened? There's been an eternal gospel preached to those who dwell on the earth, and then there's been a switch. The earth dwellers have now chosen to worship. They've decided, I will not follow God, the one who made everything. I will follow the Antichrist. That there is a volitional decision. There's something in economics called... Um, Opportunity cost. You ever heard of this term? Opportunity cost means that there's X and there's Y. And when I choose Y, I forfeit any and all opportunities for um, benefit associated with X. You with me? Okay? So if you're in business, you understand that. You got to make a decision. And when I choose right, I ignore and I choose not to go left. And this is the place we're in in this story, is that they have chosen now to worship the beast. And their future is sealed. They have lost any and all opportunity of future blessing from God. Look at what the text says. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead and on his hand, verse 10, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath. That... The Antichrist in the day, it's, it's an identical phrase. You see how they made the nations drink the wine, the cup of their sexual morality? See that? The same picture happens here, that he will drink the wine of God's wrath. That the two cups are equated. That it looks like my false worship will give me uh, safety, security, peace, comfort, and significance in this evil day where everything is a mess. But in reality, I will be drinking the wine of the wrath of God poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. You know, there might not be a more sobering verse than that up to this point in the book of Revelation. That God will pour out his wrath for all eternity on those who fail to worship him rightly. Forever and ever, no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. See, eternity is not something we like to talk about, but it's in black and white in the scriptures. That we're all headed somewhere, that our worship profoundly matters. Our faith in Jesus Christ profoundly matters. Our, your unbelief in Jesus Christ and what he has done through his perfect life, death, burial, resurrection, profoundly matters to your eternity. It's not suggestion in the book of Revelation. The command of the angel is to worship God, to fear God, to give glory to God. And with angel number three, it shows you that destruction of our idols is not just prophesied, but that our eternity is sealed if we refuse Jesus. You with me? So how do we live? How does this change today for you now? And that's what John says next. Look at verse 12. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints. 
listen, I know that you bring temptations in here. You bring uncertainty in here in your relationship with God. You face fights in your soul to go, do I really believe that Jesus is who he says he is? If so, why is my life going this way? Why can't I hear his voice? Why can't I see what he's doing? Why can't I understand what is going? It looks like the whole world is against this life of faith. Have you felt that? That it seems we, we're running uphill, that we're trying to swim upstream, that we're holding to the truth of Jesus and who he is, and it looks like everybody is going the opposite way. Listen, I have been there. And I so need verse 12. I so need people in my life who say, verse 12. I had a guy who discipled me who years ago said, there are no successful maverick Christians. Because sheep on their own, they turn into pulled pork. Is that right, sheep or pork? I don't know. <laughs> you get it. Here's a call for the endurance of the saints. What do the saints need in this day? Now watch this. This is important. Throughout this passage, you have the world going after worship of the Antichrist. What is worship? What is our? What is a Christian? What does a saint's worship look like? Can I show that to you? It's not raising your hands. Right, we, yeah, I know you try to do that here and you feel bad. Look at this. I, nothing's happening to me. Isn't this amazing? He said, he said, thank you, Lord. Get that on tape for you. What does a life of worship look like? Can I, I, I want to encourage you with this. This is so good. Because here are the saints in an evil day where they, where, where they can't buy, they can't sell. They're probably losing family members. They're losing friends to the truth of the gospel. The Antichrist is coming for him. He's looking to destroy their entire life. And here comes this call of endurance for the saints from John himself, who's on the island of Patmos, who's experiencing exile because of his faithfulness in Jesus Christ and the word of his testimony. And he's saying, hang in there. Keep going. Don't quit. What does a life of worship look like? Look at the remainder of the verse. Those who keep the commandments of God. You ever feel like, let me talk to young moms for a minute. You feel like you've got that baby and your faithfulness to Jesus Christ is doing little, unnoticed, non-famous, nobody is aware of them kind of things to keep that baby alive. And you're praying over that baby and you're putting your hope in God on display in that baby and you're sleepy and you're tired and you don't know what is gonna happen with that baby if that baby's gonna get up or get down or go to sleep or get, you know, it's itchy and it's angry and it's going potty, all of these things that comes with raising kids, right? And you do all of these kind of obedient kind of things that are relatively unseen by the vast majority of people. Keep going, keep going. See, we feel like our obedience is unseen. Right? Remember when Jesus talks in Matthew 6 about the spiritual practices of giving, praying, and fasting? When you do these things, go into your closet in secret, and your heavenly Father who sees what is done in secret will what? He'll reward you. Saints, your life of worship in simple steps of obedience is seen by God. Do you believe that? Say amen. Amen. Because somebody next to you needs to hear amen. Number two, they keep their faith in Jesus. God, I'm obeying, I'm trusting Jesus, and I'm taking my next, I, I've said this before to our staff team, and I ask this question. God, for us, guys, for us as a church, when we lead our people and we honor God with the work that we do, I want to know what is our next faithful step of obedience. That's it. I don't want to get on the other side into eternity and God goes, you had a lot of great ideas that weren't my ideas, right? No leader wants to hear that. 
So we ask this question, what is our next faithful step of obedience? Where we're trusting Christ to do what only Jesus can do. We're obeying in all the ways that we know how, but we're also taking step forward to have faith in Jesus Christ and move forward so that his kingdom and his glory and his dominion would be honored and that we would seek first his kingdom of God. This is basic stuff. Now, it feels unimpressive because obedience is not that popular Faith in Jesus feels, I don't know, squishy. I'm not sure exactly. And you don't just need to hear it from John, who's on the island. You need to hear it from God himself. And that's how this passage ends. This passage ends with God himself speaking a word of blessing over those who are doing the faithful, simple steps of obedience with Jesus in a time when everything is against them in a time when they are watching martyrdom happen, God himself in this text speaks up. It's one of the two places in the whole book of Revelation where the spirit of God speaks too. Look at verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this down. Remember, that? Remember that? that's how this book starts, right? Write the things, that you ha- the things that are, the things that you have seen, and the things that will come after these things. So when God says to write this down, when God says, grab a pen, would you agree that it's important? Shot in the dark, this is probably important. So here's God affirming what John has just said to the people in his day. They know what is to come. They know the sinful world system is going to burn. They know that eternity is at stake for those who fail to worship Jesus Christ. And here's how we started. We need to know the stakes. We need to know where we're headed. We need to know why our faith needs to have that North Star. I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Remember what it said about the saints in this book? They overcame the dragon because they washed their robes in the blood of the lamb. They overcame him by the uh, word of their testimony, for they loved their lives, not even to death. And God himself says they're blessed, that they have something that the antichrist, the false worship, and Satan himself cannot take away. That death itself that will will steal our health and our money and our hopes on this earth cannot stop the blessing of God. Christian, can I, do you hear me? That what you're experiencing now, Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians, that these, these, um, I have it in here somewhere. Talk amongst yourselves. Yes. 2 Corinthians 4, for these light and momentary afflictions are working for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. See, I have this struggle where I just have this tendency to live in an eternal present where I go, is the gospel good? I don't know, it's Tuesday and things are going bad. I guess not. Uh, Wednesday, things are good again. The gospel, I believe the gospel. Jesus is great. Right, and I, I do this through my Christian life. And in this wicked day where Satan is, in, is, quite frankly, totally in control, God himself speaks from heaven and says, because of your faithfulness, your obedience, your simple acts of holding to your faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done for you, you are blessed and you have something that death cannot take away. Now watch this. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit. Isn't that good? Man, isn't that good? that the Spirit himself goes, me too, I've got something to say. He is right. Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit all proclaim a blessing over those who are enduring. That the Spirit himself says, blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. What are their deeds in context? They're holding to the faith of Jesus Christ in a wicked day when they don't get any blessings or any benefits for believing in Jesus. They can't buy, they can't sell, they can't protect their family. They they see friends and family who are uh, given up to martyrdom and they are holding the line in a wicked and evil day. 
and that their deeds of faithfulness, watch this, they follow them. That as they step into eternity, what echoes from their lives will affect their entire eternity. So this is a pretty sobering text, isn't it? Do you see what's at stake? Do you see it's not just this year? This is the thing that bothers me about gospel preaching, is that gospel preaching has been reduced now to kind of um, temporal gospel. That if you believe in Jesus, things will go well. If you believe in Jesus, your 401k will grow. If you believe in Jesus, you're going to get that job or get that man or get that watch or get that car. And that bothers me as somebody who's called to preach an eternal gospel. We stand as a church, we stand as Christians between heaven and hell and eternity. And we've got a message to proclaim that will affect somebody's forever. You hear me? Forever. This is why your sanctification right now on Sunday afternoon matters. This is why your endurance and that temptation that you're fighting right now matters because you are not going to succeed in your sanctification journey fighting the temptations of this world unless you see where you're headed. You won't do it because you'll live for, you know, 20 minutes from now. You'll live for 10 years from now. You won't live for forever. And that's why this is here. Now, we can end positive or we can end negative. How do you want to end? You want to end happy or sad? <laughs> happy. Okay, happy you get. Let's get happy. Go to, this is the last thing I'm going to give you. Turn to, Rev, turn to uh, First Peter. First Peter chapter 1. If you want to end sad and you're one of those people, you want to be mournful, go read Mark 8. When Jesus talks about discipleship and uh, people forsaking his words in a sinful and adulterous generation, not going to go good for them. I thought we should bless the church and the people who follow Jesus. They need to be encouraged because they're going to get up with eternity on their minds and need to, they need to know where we're all headed. Amen? Let's go. First Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though for now, for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen? That's where we're headed. Father in heaven, we are so, uh, sobered when we come to Revelation 14. This is a scary text. Father, for those of us in this room who are facing temptation and unbelief and uncertainty about walking with you right now, I pray that 1 Peter chapter 1 would wash over their souls, that they wouldn't abandon their fight for faith that they would trust you, that they would obey the commandments of God and hold to faith in Jesus Christ. God, how much we need this message. We need this reorienting. We need to remember eternity. Father, would you give us the power and the strength and the courage in an evil day to live wisely in light of where we're headed? Would we understand the stakes of our life of faith. We thank you so much for Jesus who has saved us and made us whole. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.